Gartner predicts that by 2023, 93% of organizations will be doing some form of SD-WAN for the WAN edge. And the reasons for this disruption are obvious. Save money by not being as reliant on private circuits, better application performance with intelligent monitoring and steering, and simplified management with orchestrators and zero-touch provisioning. But with all of these moving parts come old and new security concerns. I'm Andy with the CISO Perspective, and today we're going to look at five considerations for securing SD-WAN. First thing to realize is that not all SD-WAN is created equal. With the explosion of SD-WAN over the last few years, we're seeing more and more vendors incorporate SD-WAN as a feature into their existing product offering. That means that we have an influx of traditional networking, WAN optimization, and security vendors who are now competing with the pure play SD-WAN vendors. While this means more options for the consumer, you also have an abundance of SD-WAN vendors to pick from with varying levels of proficiency. The security offerings from the various vendors can be grouped into three general categories, cloud-based, third-party integrators, or built-in security. Cloud-based security means the SD-WAN device is not doing any local inspection, and instead it offloads all the packets that require inspection to a cloud service. That means that for every packet that needs to be inspected, the SD-WAN device is forwarding it off to a cloud for security inspection. Third-party integration usually comes in the form of service chaining using VMs, Service chaining is an SDN terminology to describe multiple virtual services working together within a physical box. In most cases, SD-WAN would provide the networking service while the security vendor would provide the security services. All of this happening on the same physical box using a hypervisor and an SDN controller. Built-in security offering means a security inspection is happening in the SD-WAN appliance itself. These are generally traditional security devices like a UTM or next-gen firewall that have SD-WAN as a feature. All three options have their pros and cons, but from a security perspective, there's one option that you should only use as a last resort, and that leads us to the first item on our list. Number one, opt for on-premise security whenever possible. From a security perspective, on-premise security is always preferred over the cloud for a number of reasons. Not only does it provide additional services that the cloud-based solution doesn't offer, but it also lowers your bandwidth costs and increases performance at the edge. For cloud inspection to work properly, all branch internet traffic must be forwarded to the cloud through a GRE or an IPsec tunnel. That means a regular user traffic needs to be forwarded to the nearest cloud data center, inspected, and then forwarded off to the destination. That means that if you have an SD-WAN rule to route an application like Office 365 directly out to the internet without going through the cloud inspection first, it bypasses security altogether. In other words, everything needs to route through the security cloud. This removes almost all the benefit of implementing SD-WAN in the first place. It also means higher WAN usage, which leads to higher costs, particularly if you're using a 4G card as a backup link, which charges per megabyte. On-prem security can be accomplished with an SD-WAN vendor that either provides security services natively on the box or through service chaining with a security VNF. Both options greatly increase the performance on traffic that requires security inspection while also lowering the cost by reducing the amount of traffic that is sent off through the WAN. Not to mention the number of security services that cannot be performed in the cloud like segmentation, access layer security, intra-branch security inspection, for example, scanning malware on a file share at the branch, breach containment, quarantine, and even local authentication has a lot of caveats if you're behind the NAT. So look out for that and how that's being handled by the particular SD-WAN vendor. Ultimately, cloud security services should only be used when on-premise security is simply not an option. This seems to be the case with a lot of the more popular peer play SD-WAN vendors who partner with cloud security vendors to provide that security. Number two, application routing best practices. If you ultimately decide to offload security inspection to the cloud, then this point becomes all the more important. In SD-WAN, we create rules that specify where to route application or groups of application. So a question you'll have to ask yourself is, what do I do with applications that may be a security risk? Before you get to that point, you have to first identify the applications that are actually in use. Next, identify which of these applications need to be backhauled to your cloud or data center. These will be called known corporate applications. For applications that use a direct internet connection, let's call them known SaaS applications. For business continuity, it's critical that these applications always work at all times through redundant paths. The next group of applications can be a group called allowed application. These could be applications that pose little to no security risk and are allowed out to the internet to provide business functionality. Now, we want to group the applications that pose a security risk. And if you're choosing an SD-WAN product that does not have built-in security, this part may be non-existent, which is why you'll need to forward it off to a cloud security service for inspection. Again, not ideal. 
SD-WAN products with built-in security will offer layer 7 identification of potentially risky application. This category could include things like botnet activity, security evasion software, proxy avoidance, and many more. We'll also want to create an application group for applications that we know should never be used. For example, if your company is using an internal file share, we can block all other forms of file sharing like Dropbox and Google Drive. Ultimately, these unwanted categories should be blocked before ever leaving the site. If your SD-WAN does not support blocking, make sure it's being black holed or sent off to the security device for more inspection. Number three, look out for network leakage. MPLS, broadband, LTE, and IPsec tunnel overlays are just a few of the interfaces that SD-WAN has to manage. To simplify administration, SD-WAN vendors will usually group these interfaces into a single interface to remove the complexity of having to manage rules and policies for each WAN interface. In some cases, this could lead to less than desirable routes to and from protected zones. Let's use the following example. Your MPLS link, broadband, and IPsec overlay are all part of your SD-WAN interface. You receive default gateways from your MPLS and broadband provider, which means users now have two routes to the data center from either the MPLS or the broadband link. So you create a policy to allow internal users out to your SD-WAN interface, which includes these multiple individual interfaces. Except internal users should never go out through the broadband link to your data center without routing through your IPsec tunnel overlay. So you create an SD-WAN rule that allows users to your data center through the IPsec tunnel in the event your MPLS link goes down. But here's the part you have to be careful with. Some vendors treat SD-WAN rules like firewall policies with a generic catch-all in the bottom that routes everything it doesn't have a rule for. And rules are sometimes only active as long as their health checks or SLAs are being met. So in a scenario where your MPLS link is unavailable and your backup IPsec tunnel is underperforming, your SD-WAN rule won't take into effect and you end up using the default catch-all which goes to your routing table. And since we have default gateways through our broadband link, we end up with internal users going out through the public internet and leaking private IP information. There's many examples and scenarios we could review, but the takeaway is this. Analyze your network requirements and make sure your vendor gives you the flexibility to make individual interface decisions. This can vary greatly by vendor, so make sure you understand the different scenarios in which routing can be influenced by an SD-WAN rule. When not used properly, the simplicity of SD-WAN can bring on unexpected security challenges that were not seen on traditional routers. Number four, transport security. As companies move away from private circuits and utilize the unsecure public internet to transport data into private resources, strong encryption in your VPN tunnels become critical. This means making sure you have strong VPN encryption settings and have it tunneled back to your data center or cloud services. For starters, you need to make sure you're utilizing a VPN anytime you're accessing private resources across a WAN. This means both private circuits and direct internet access, like broadband or LTE cards. In a common scenario with one MPLS and one broadband connection, this means having at least one IPsec tunnel through each WAN port. If your data center has redundant ports or paths, you'll also need redundant IPsec tunnels to each port. So you can see that even in this most basic setup, we already have four IPsec tunnels. And if you have a backup LTE or 4G card, consider using an on-demand IPsec tunnel that will only come up when the other ports are down. This is gonna save you on mobile data charges. Next, let's talk about VPN best practices. Always, always, always use a secure protocol like IPsec. If you have legacy requirements for GRE or L2TP, make sure they ride over that IPsec tunnel first. These older protocols do not encrypt the data in transport, so you should always ride over a secure tunnel like IPsec. This part is especially critical if you're using cloud security, which sometimes they recommend to use unsecured protocols for traffic offloading like GRE or HTTP proxies. When using IPsec, consider the following best practices. Use certificates over pre-shared keys, and if you need to use pre-shared keys, make sure that they're longer than 20 characters in length. Use Ike version 2 whenever possible. Avoid weak encryption methods like DES and triple DES. Avoid weak hashing algorithms like MD5 or SHA-1. And avoid Diffie-Hellman groups 1 and 2. Don't assume these basic requirements are a given on any modern SD-WAN vendor. Many of these vendors have actually simplified the deployment process to the point where basic IPsec changes are either impossible or difficult to do at scale. Number five, CASB. Part of the appeal with SD-WAN is the ability for remote offices and branch locations to access their cloud applications directly without having to ride back an expensive MPLS circuit to get there securely. From a business perspective, I may want branch locations to only ride that expensive MPLS circuit for services in my data center or cloud, but use a cheaper broadband for direct internet connection of my SaaS applications. 
This creates a massive problem for security admins as more and more organizations use cloud applications like Salesforce and Office 365 to store sensitive data. So how can we secure and control access to our SaaS applications? One way is to use CASB in combination with our SD-WAN at the branch. CASB stands for Cloud Access Security Brokers, and it enforces security and global policies for all of our cloud applications. This means that we can have much greater visibility and policy enforcement to these applications that we couldn't otherwise get with a traditional security appliance. With CASB, you can now see and control down to the file how your data is being used. Some common use cases could be a user downloading sensitive data to an unsanctioned device, or a user moving PII data on or off a cloud service. These are things that we would have been blind to without a CASB solution. But when working in conjunction with your SE WAN appliance, you can now do global enforcement of all of these policies. So if my organization is using Office 365, CASB gives me control of what they can and cannot do with that particular application. If my CASB has integration with SD-WAN, I can now do things like quarantine that user who started to move files suspiciously or cut that user off down to the access layer if we notice a malware is coming from the endpoint. As a digital transformation moves more and more services to servers that we cannot control, CASB is becoming as crucial to our security plan as a firewall once was. In fact, Gartner predicts that by 2020, 60% of all large enterprises are going to be using CASB to govern cloud services. Well, that does it for this video, you guys, and I hope you found it informative. You can now visit me at the CISOperspective.com for my blog entries, past video research, questions, and suggestions for future videos. You can also reach me at the CISO Perspective at gmail.com. As always, please comment, hit like, subscribe to stay on top of our latest releases here at the CISO Perspective.